but we could we could see what our bay temperatures are. I mean, we had a selector for that, and the cockpit. We had two ind two independent air conditioners that uh, either one would cool the cockpit to survival, but you need both of them to be comfortable. How do I know? Because I lost one one time, <laughs> and the cockpit got up to 100, 160, I think, or something like that. It was it was it was damn hot. Now, the the good news is that we had. We had air circulating in our pressure suit, and if you inflate your pressure suit, then you are somewhat insulated from the outside temperature. But what was funny was it was it was 160 may be too much, maybe it's 140, but it was above 120. Because 120 is what it is at, in, in Arizona, you know, in the summertime. But it was it was hot to touch the control stick. Control stick was really hot. Yeah, I could feel it through the garden gloves, the, the pressure suit gloves. Anyway, that was just one time that I, did, I lost that uh, one air conditioner. And we continued the mission. I mean, it was uncomfortable, but if we'd lost the other one, then we might. The, the thing is that I don't know how quickly the cockpit would heat up. Obviously, you can't live in 600 degree Fahrenheit temperature. That's that's your oven on cleaning cycle. Seriously. So you can't, you can't stay at that. Well, if you uh, did emergency descent, I think you could get down pretty quick. The thing is, is you have to reduce your speed. That's that's the big reduce your speed. I, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not sort of engineering-y or sort of aerodynamically minded. Uh, so I hope this isn't an absurd question. But you you mentioned low dynamic pressure. Does that mean that if you had, for whatever reason, to eject at that altitude, even though the Mark number would have been high, the uh, the impact of the airflow on you, your body, as you left the airplane, would not have been as as great as as, as maybe sort of you were lower down and a bit slower. Well, the, the, the problem with ejecting at that altitude is that the outside air temperature is about one quarter of one pound per square inch. And, and, and it's, it's virtually a vacuum. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't keep your body pressurized somehow, then you're going to die instantly. And I mean instantly. Your blood will boil. All your blood will boil. And uh, it would not be good. So you really depend on your pressure suit. The pressure suit is your, is your get me down suit. It's, a, it's your lifeline. I never had a uh, loss of pressurization, so I never had to use it in emergency. But every every uh, year, I think it was, we were in an altitude chamber, and they would do that. They would put the altitude chamber down to maybe 60,000 feet. It wouldn't be all the way to 80,000, but down to 60. And then uh, they would uh, depressurize it, or pressurize it by, uh, they have two two chambers. You're in the small chamber, in the big chamber, they take down to 60,000 feet, you're here, and then they, they bring the two chambers together. So uh, what happens is you, the, uh, you're you really isolated from breathing any of this air because you get uh, there's two independent systems of oxygen going into your helmet. It's 100% oxygen fed into the face, face plate, which is sealed at all times. And so that, but the instance is, first of all, there's instant fog and the, the they're testing whether the pressure suit will inflate. It inflates immediately. I don't mean within a second, but I mean immediately. So you go, whoosh, and then, of course, your hands are like, like the Pillsbury Doughboy, <laughs> like this. But it's still enough that, you know, if you've got some biceps, you can, you can fly an airplane. Like that. But that, that people have ejected at Mach 3, so there are there are demonstrations for that. Uh, St. Martin and uh, Car Carnahan were uh, guys at Mach Mach 3 ejected. They said that it uh, felt like somebody hitting uh, hitting them with a two by four, not not wham in the face, but just whoo, you know, back, back, just hit them like that. And that uh, I think they might have lost consciousness too. But it was kind of a funny thing. On the maybe they didn't. The suit had built-in life preserver, three of them. So if you fell out over the ocean, and we did a lot of over ocean flying, then uh, you you wouldn't even have to be conscious to have everything work okay. You would have to raise, the, you know, it's, it's funny that uh, most people think that you'd have to, you, you could lower your face plate and that's what, no, you have to raise your face plate because if you go underwater with your face plate, there's an anti-suffocation valve and the water would come in there and fill up your face plate. So you got to open that. Oh, the other thing is that written on our pressure suit sleeve, if you ever see a picture of somebody in a pressure suit, you'll see written here and here are two checklists and those are checklists that you perform on the way down from your ejection <laughs> always like to say well it'll, it'll it'll give you something to do because you're going to be falling for a while a few minutes and uh, it automatically opens it a parachute automatically goes at 15,000 you have a life preserver and a, i mean a, a raft a survival kit that automatically deploy just like a normal fighter airplane oh and the other thing is that the face plate had a built-in battery in the suit that would keep the face plate from fogging up because obviously if you're out in the minus 60 uh, ambient to air, it's going to fog up so that you can read that checklist. You can be advised that the advisor will be 
Okay, we'll be clear. Let, let's return to the, uh, the, the the progress of the sortie in a second. But I, I just wanted to, before I forget, uh, on a bit of a tangent, ask you about landing in the sea then because i think there was one individual who ejected and landed in the sea and drowned um yes. uh, i mean what were you what were you expected to do if you landed in the sea were you expected to just stay in the space suit well sorry i keep calling it space suit. were you expected to stay in the pressure suit and get yourself into your life raft and just wait to be rescued uh, were you supposed to get out of the pressure suit somehow well you didn't have a choice you, there's no way you could get out of the pressure suit can you take the helmet off i mean well you could take the helmet off uh, but you didn't have to the helmet's pretty good to you know protect your head from hitting things no the way you practice that we uh, went through water survival in the pressure suit i've been through it i don't know four or five times where they actually put you out in the water with a raft and uh, then you you practice getting in you'd go to the back of the raft grab both sides close down and then pull that and so you it, as long as you get your cg inside the raft then you can wiggle with it you know to get to get the raft under you. So it's doable. It's not easy, but it's doable. And uh, I didn't, I won't say I didn't have any problem, but I, I got into the raft successfully each time. And then uh, once you're in the raft, then you can take your helmet off, sure. Is there, is there, I mean, I, I, the one thing I sort of, I, I would wonder is whether it could fill with water and, and then well, just yes, drag, drag you down. So so would that, you do your take? You had, that's why you had three life preservers on you. Okay. But sure then you think about sort of the ejection process and whether or not those could become, I don't know, maybe this is just not how you'd think if you were flying the aircraft like you did. You just don't go through the different scenarios. But I think, well, what happens What happens if well, there's, uh, two there's, of them don't, don't inflate? Well, I don't know what to say about that. If they don't inflate, you're in big trouble. That's why That's why you flew for a living and uh, and, and, and others don't, because you, you don't go that far in your, in your thinking then. Well, the, the, the stuff that they, uh, they give us for life-saving stuff, equipment, is darn good it is good it's checked and the people who do it are professionals i can't tell you how i mean i i had one suit malfunction one time and it inflated when i couldn't control it, it inflated on my way to the tanker so here i am like this and i said well you know i really can't do the mission with this because we're, we're, we were not allowed unless we were in bad territory or something we're not allowed to continue our mission with an inflated pressure suit because you are restricted. But I tried everything. I even radioed back to uh, physiological support people and asked them, and it just wasn't anything I could do about it. So the, the way that you depressurize your suit is to uh, break the seal at the at the glove. And now, now it's just a normal thing. It's a normal flight suit then. So, so you're up at, uh, you haven't ejected, you're up at uh, sort of 70 odd thousand feet, climbing as you get lighter, uh, Mark 3.2. Uh, what's what, what happens next? Or maybe, you could introduce. You mentioned it a, a few minutes ago. On starts into the into the equation. Yeah, what are you yeah. dealing with as a pilot? Then? Well, I say first of all, you you have to be at the right altitude given the, the gross weight and everything. If if you're lower than that altitude, then uh, your not so cool and airspeed will be too high for that altitude. If you are higher uh, than you should be, then they'll, it'll, your not so cool and airspeed will be too low. So you want to have you want to have everything right. You want to have it optimal. Because I tell you, there's a Lockheed historian engineer named Steve Justice, and I heard him describe. Now he's not a pilot and he never flown the airplane, but I heard him describe it better than I've ever heard it before. He said, "Flying the SR-71 is like taking your sports car out to a freeway and floorboarding it and keeping it there for an hour or so. You're flying at the max speed you can go, and everything. All you know, the dynamic pressure limit is is, is getting uh, the temperature, the Mach, all of that is is is, is at the the max. So it's a point design airplane for th Mach 3.2. Anything off of Mach 3.2 is uh, not optimum. The other thing about if you're at Mach 3 and you want to save gas, you accelerate. And that's true. You get much better of a gas mileage at Mach 3.2. But at Mach 3.2, your temperature is a lot hotter. You're higher. You have to be higher. And when you are higher, you have less damping. You have less uh, dynamic. You have less uh, ambient air pressure. The airplane is not uh, as maneuverable. And what I mean by maneuverable is one uh, characteristic of an unstart is a pitch up. It always gives you a pitch up of some kind. The faster you are and the higher you are, the worse the pitch up was. I was doing a test at Edwards on the DAFIC system. And we'd never done a full rudder side slip at Mach 3.2. So I, and we decided, Tom Tilden and I decided that we would put that in the, in the flight manual. Yeah, okay, in the flight plan. So I went up at Mach 3.2 and did a full rudder side slip. Well, it was just fine until I got to that last inch. And when I got the last inch, it let go like I had never seen before. If you enjoyed this clip and want more, you can go to 10 hit subscribe. 
and get early ad-free access to all my content. Appreciate your support.